Hey, Tom, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, who's that? Hey, Tom, can you hear me? Yeah, is that Colin? Yeah, it is. Yep. Gene, you there? Hi. Hi, Todd, Colin. Hi, Tom. Hey, hey, Gene, how are you? Good. Colin, I guess I'll see you in a few weeks, yeah? For, uh-oh, what for? <laughs> My trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, am I going to see you in New York at the fabulous WCS facility? I I don't know. I've, I Apparently can't, not. I, we'll talk I, later. I can't even look past December at the moment. But <laughs> Well, that's probably true. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing it, as you'd expect, an organization like us, we're doing a big analysis and reanalysis of, of our priorities and such. So we're really, mm, yeah. which is what I'm going to be talking about here. So you'll get awesome. to hear all about it. Hey, um, um, all right, so guys, go ahead, Tom. yeah, we're, we're live, oh. um, <laughs> but no, that's cool. Um, but we're a few minutes away. Um, Bill Mott has also been promoted to a panelist. Bill? Bill? Yep, I was okay. uh, just unmuting myself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in. I'm going to be f silent on this, though. That's, that's fine. And we're get, beginning to get people showing up. For all those who are logged on, we'll get going in just a couple of minutes. Like five minutes.
Okay, we'll get started in just another minute for those who are joining us. <clears throat> Okay, um, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Adams, I'm the policy advisor for the Ocean Project, um, and we're delighted to have you here today um, for our next webinar in the Making Conservation Happen Brown Bag webinar series. Just a note, a quick note from the beginning, uh, this is being recorded. <clears throat> um, my voice is a bit scratchy, sorry about that. Uh, but as soon as we get the recording downloaded in the next day or two, it'll be available on the Ocean Project's website, which is theoceanproject.org. Um, we'll also be posting a PDF version of the slides. I say that because there's a couple of them um, with a lot of names and their committee assignments that we're gonna go over pretty quickly, but if you wanna go back for reference sake, um, you'll be able to do that. I'm also just wanna let everyone know that we are grateful to the uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for um, their help in providing these uh, webinar series, the funding for it, we're very grateful for it. Um, so I want to um, also start by thanking Jean Flemma who, and uh, Colin Sheldon who will be speaking in a little bit and we will give a, an introduction for them at that point. Um, and Colin and Jean, I think you guys have muted yourself, but if we, when we get to your part, um, if you're not speaking, I'll, I'll let you in. And um, um, it, once you're unmuted, feel free to chime in at any point of the webinar. Okay, so we're gonna get going. Um, here we go. So um, the goals for today is we want to give you guys a quick update on sort of the end game of what's happening with the current Congress, which is the 115th Congress. They're currently in a lame duck session um, and we'll sort of give you a rundown of, of what's probably going to happen and what may not happen. Uh, then we'll turn our attention to the new Congress, which will convene on January 3rd. And uh, obviously there's been quite a bit of change with the results of the election and the Democrats taking over um, the majority in the House. And so we'll dive into that a little bit um, and look at, you know, sort of a, a 40,000 foot overview of the newer members who've just been elected, uh, who the leaders are expected to be, and what the priorities um, that the House Democrats have already begun to uh, articulate. Um, uh, Jean Flemma, who's a former uh, House Natural Resources Committee staffer, uh, uh, will then talk a little bit, uh, well, we'll talk about what that committee is likely to look like, what its priorities are, uh, which would be dramatically different from the last Congress. Um, and then uh, Colin will talk about how um, they have engaged their delegation and other members of Congress for quite a while. Colin's with, by the way, I should say, with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, and he'll talk about um, some legislation they're working on, which is called the Wild Act, which I think would be um, of interest to a lot of 
uh, the zoos, aquariums, and museums that are going to be uh, that are tuning in today because of some of the programs that it um, uh, extends and and authorizes funding for. And we'll get into a little bit of the congressional process to do that. So um, again, this is sort of a, a I think I kind of covered this in the last slide, but we'll talk about um, what's happening right now in the transition to the next Congress. Um, and uh, I guess they already kind of talked about what Gene and, and Colin will talk about. So I'm saving time by consolidating. I'll skip right through to the, uh, to me. Um, so what, what happens when, in, there, there's a lot of little stuff that happens when a Congress ends. First of all, members that aren't returning have already begun packing their offices their staff's looking for work. New members are beginning to establish offices, hiring staff, and all of that sort of works into the mix. Um, but on the big picture stuff, um, right now there's the lame duck session. Uh, and what uh, there's a little humor there. But a, a lame duck session is basically when they meet after an election uh, before the new Congress convenes. Um, and lame ducks, I think, is a you know is, is a word for a lot of the folks uh, that are leaving town. So right now they've got a few things that are being talked about. Not all of these are going to get done. The one thing they absolutely need to do is they passed about half the appropriations bills. Those are the bills that fund government. Um, it, the ones they've passed account for about seventy percent of funding for the federal government through the next fiscal year, which runs to September 30th, 2019. So they have to finish up <clears throat> the other bills. And once they get that done, uh, they'll leave town. A big thing that's holding that up right now is, if you're following in the news, is, uh, is the whole border wall funding issue. Um, and there's a bit of a stare down on that and there's threats to shut the government down over it by the president and we'll see how it works out. Um, another big bill that they're getting close to finishing that's on the priority list is the farm bill. It's a five-year, usually a five-year authorization of federal farm programs, crop subsidies, and that sort of stuff. It's very important for a lot of, um, obviously for a lot of members, um, in, in especially from rural communities and rural states. Uh, the, the last few things down here uh, the, are, are things that are probably going to get talked about a lot in terms of criminal justice judicial nominations and the Mueller protection bill, but, but do not look like uh, they're gonna see much action. And then there's odds and ends, which are bills of a much smaller scale that are just sitting around and they're trying to finish them. And there's these voids in the schedule that they're able to do that in. So there are some things that'll sneak through under that um, and, uh, uh, and that'll keep them busy and, and frankly keeps members in town for votes. So, when they finish their business, they'll do something called adjournment and signy die. They'll bang a gavel down. They'll all go away. The bills that uh, have not passed basically die and need to be reintroduced in the next Congress. And contrary to the rumor, the Dalai Lama will not wave goodbye to all of the members. Um, so the 116th Congress will start on January 3rd. Uh, the issues on the right-hand side are things we're going to hear a lot about. I think the ones in the blue, there'll be action on, large or small. The ones that are in, uh, uh, in green, you'll hear a lot of talk about, but they're really sort of going to be wedge issues that are going to be meant to sort of, you know, basically set up uh, arguments for the 2020 election, which has basically started. So the whole ping pong analogy here is, is I think, I think it's safe to assume that with a Democratic controlled House and a Republican controlled Senate, they're going to be trying to send uh, bills and messages and issues to the other one uh, that put them in a, in a tough place, especially on those green items on the right. Uh, and they'll just knock these things back and forth, hence the ping pong analogy. Okay, so moving to the um, freshman class for the Senate. Um, in the top picture are the Republican senators, minus the third from the right, who's Mitch McConnell, the majority leader. Um, most of those are new members. There's a couple that are um, coming over from the House, including Marsha Blackburn, who's the, who's the woman in the center. She's from Tennessee. Uh, the two solo photos on the bottom are the two Democratic freshmen newly elected. Uh, the left is Kristen Sinema from Arizona, and the right is Jackie Rosen from Nevada. Um, 
so contrast those two, three pictures with this one right here, which is of the house freshman class. And the, you know, the joke in Washington is for men at least, all you need is a couple of blue suits and a couple of gray suits. And if you look at that picture, that pretty much gets all of the men, but you see an awful lot of color in there. Uh, and, and that's I mean, what that shows you is how diverse this Congress is gonna be, especially uh, the number of women who've been elected. And, and we will get into that a little bit later um, in other slides. So a quick summary of what the makeup of the uh, Senate's gonna be. And this is one of those slides we're gonna go through pretty quickly. Uh, 53 Republicans, 47 Democrats. It's a net gain of two for the Republicans, which is always good to gain seats. They had a map that I think a lot of people thought they'd be closer to 55, 56 uh, seats uh, when the cycle started. Um, the leadership for uh, and the Senate is basically the same uh, from last year, last Congress, except for the majority whip. Uh, the old whip was term limited out and John Thune is now in there. Um, and he will show up in just a little bit as well. So we're about to dive into some committees. So I wanted to, there's two different types of committees basically in Congress. One are appropriations committees. Those are the ones that write the, bud, the, the funding bills that fund the government and the other are authorizations. And they basically create the programs and set spending limits for it that aren't always met and aren't always uh, adhered to. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. The fastest way for me to describe this to people is those are my parents. Um, and when we were kids, uh, my father was pretty cheap, but he'd let us, just about let us do anything. So we'd ask him for permission. So he authorized our behavior and he usually did. My mother was less permissive, but more generous. So we would ask her for the money. So that she appropriated the money for our activities. So my dad, was the authorizer and my mom the appropriator. And that's basically how the process works. Um, so key committees uh, in the Senate. So we just talked about what the appropriations committee are, uh, it, it, what it is. Uh, the interesting thing with the, the chairman and the ranking Democrat is they are working really closely together. They're both what is known as institutionalist. They're really trying to protect the role of the appropriations committee and develop bills that can pass and not put members on the spot with extraneous matters. These are the key subcommittees for the folks who are on this call. Interior and Environment uh, is uh, basically is the Department of Interior, EPA, and, and, and those sorts of uh, agencies. Also, uh, uh, and then Commerce Justice State, or Commerce Justice Science, excuse me, uh, which is chaired by the chairman of the full committee. Uh, that that uh, they have oversight and funding uh, responsibilities for NOAA. So in terms of NOAA programs and ocean programs, uh, that's, that's where they receive their funding. So on the authorizing side, we mentioned John Thune uh, who or earlier, who chairs the Commerce Committee. They have oversight over fisheries policies and ocean uh, issues. And, and the subcommittee chairman is, you see is Dan Sullivan from Alaska. Um, that's a for some of the people on this uh, webinar, that's particularly of interest because of the Magnus and Stevens Act, which governs uh, fisheries policy. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and then you see energy and natural resources and environment and public works are there. Um, you'll hear a lot of talk, and we talked about infrastructure a little bit ago. That's the, uh, that's the committee that the infrastructure bill may come out of. They do highways, they do water projects, stuff like that. And I mention it because I know institutions have uh, tapped money on that when I worked for Brookfield Zoo, we did on the highway bill. But there's also the opportunity of a possible infrastructure bill, which is another word for stimulus. And those zoos and aquariums, particularly who got frozen out of the last stimulus bill, that may be a place you want to keep an eye on. So quick thing about in the, uh, Richard Shelby here, and there's a couple more slides here to talk about Senate leadership of those committees. You'll see a contrast when we get to Gene's presentation about the, 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 what the house, their house counterparts look like. Um, Shelby was first elected to office in, in state Senate in Alabama in 1970. He's basically been in office for 50 years. He switched parties uh, from Democrat to Republican in 1994. Uh, he's 84 years old, and this is one of the oldest tricks in Washington. That picture is probably 20 years old. Uh, he does not look quite that good anymore, but he's He's still with us. So uh, and then we have John Thune, who I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, interesting thing about him is he knocked off the Democratic leader to win his seat in 2004. That was the first time that had been done in about 50 years. Um, and he's also now positioned himself to be the next Republican leader should, if and when Mitch McConnell steps down. And, Tom, uh, yep. Tom, can I just interject for a second? Yes, this is Gene. With, with, this is Gene. With Senator Thune's elevation to leadership in the Senate, the expectation is that Senator Wicker will uh, become the chairman of the Commerce Committee okay. in the Senate. I just Thank wanted to know that. Thank you. I've begun to hear that. And, and Senator Wicker's from Mississippi. Uh, uh, we'll have to change that slide. Uh, and then we have um, just the chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee here is, is John Barrasso from uh, Wyoming. So that is that, um, that, with that quick overview. So uh, we were talking about, you know, the, the image earlier before of all of the freshman House members on the Capitol steps. This is what it looks like between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and obviously, you know, with the exception of the one woman at the very end of the Republican list, that's the only woman there. Uh, you look below and you see really a mosaic of, you know, all different types of people. They're from all different walks of life. We have a little bit of demographic material on the right side here that you see. I mean, the interesting things to me are is about 20%, which is 100 out of 535 members of the House and Senate are newly elected. So there's a few House members that went to the Senate, but their jobs have now changed. So this creates enormous, an enormous learning curve uh, for those 100 people, whether or not they were here before. Um, you see of, you know, the, particularly uh, the number of women, the number of veterans that have been elected, uh, Native Americans, Hispanic, other people of color, uh, all different backgrounds in terms of professions. A lot of them are newly elected and about half the Democrats uh, swore off and did not accept uh, pa uh, political action committee mem money, which is basically money from PACs or corporate interests. Uh, and that is gonna be something to watch as they move into uh, their committee assignments. So um, we did this sort of biographical slide of the Senate few minutes ago. This is the House. There's 435 members. Um, right now, uh, the ratio is 235 to 200, although there should be an asterisk in there because of what's happening with the disputed election in North Carolina. So right now, there's really 434 decided seats. Uh, if, that's, if the Republicans hold that seat in North Carolina, it'll still be a net gain of 40 for the Democrats largest gain since 1974, which was the Watergate class. Uh, that class came in and had a lot of reform on its mind. It changed how Congress worked. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that uh, later in here because there's it's a possibility that's gonna happen again. Uh, we have the expected leadership on the Democratic side. Really the only question there is, is that speaker. And I don't, I think pretty much everyone believes Nancy Pelosi is, uh, is gonna hang on for that. Um, so, all right, so key House committees, we did this on the Senate. Um, here on appropriations, Nita Lowy, who's from New York, uh, uh, and Kay Granger from Texas. Uh, it's the first time there's, I, I, it's the first time there's been a, or have been female chairs and ranking Republicans. The ranking Republican is a senior member of the minority party. Uh, the chairs of those subcommittees that we mentioned earlier, um, I added labor HHS education in here because that's the bill that funds IMLS. And I know a lot of folks uh, have tapped into IMLS money. Uh, and I know in the past AZA and AAM have made that a, a priority issue on their lobby days. Um, and now we have on, on the House side, it's a little easier in terms of the Committee of Jurisdiction for a lot of uh, the, the issues that affect fish, wildlife, and the environment because they mostly reside um, on the Natural Resources Committee. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jean, who's going to go into what does this mean, what, what does the new majority mean for Congress, and sort of a preview of what we might see from the House Natural Resources Committee. Um, Jean, just let me know when you want me to flip the slides. I assume I should do that now. Uh, no, you can leave this slide okay. for a minute. Um, I just wanted to, somebody in the chat noted, and I think this is important to note that 
most likely everyone on this call has new members in their district, or excuse me, in their in the district that they're, where their institution is located. It's a, there's a very good chance that you have a new, at least a new member somewhere uh, re reasonably close to your institution. And that's a great opportunity moving forward to uh, reach out and educate and start a relationship that we'll talk a little bit about more. But I, I did notice that someone put that in the chat. So I just wanted to flag that given that 20% of the Congress is effectively new members. So um, yeah, next slide, Tom. Um, so just briefly, I wanted to touch on the fact as Tom noted, 20% of the Congress is new. What this is gonna mean is that a significant number of seats are gonna be changing hands, particularly in the House. So we're gonna have a, a, a significant number of new leadership members as we just discussed, um, particularly on the Appropriations Committee and on the Natural Resources Committee, which are both of, uh, rep, uh, of interest to people on this call. One other thing that I don't have in the slides here, but I wanna note is the fact that there has been a lot of discussion about the possible resurrection of the House Select Committee on Climate and Energy. And this was a committee that existed um, the last time the Democrats were in the majority in the House. And, Senator Markey, who at the time was Congressman Markey, chaired that committee. And that was a committee that basically uh, focused exclusively on climate change and the, the challenges that we faced as a country as a result of climate change. It had no legislative authority. It was, it was effectively a, uh, an oversight and um, opportunity for elevating that issue. Um, there's been a lot of talk from the new progressive members of Congress that have been elected about resurrecting that committee. And in addition, many of them, including um, the new Congresswoman from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or AOC as I like to call her, um, they've been pressing for that committee to get uh, legislative jurisdiction, which I, as you can imagine, um, the other committees that do currently have the the authority to legislate on that issue won't really be that um, interested in seeing that happen. But that is, there's a, there's a large or a significant chance that that committee will be resurrected in some format. And the big question will be whether or not it has any authority to legislate. So I just wanted to note that. Uh, as Tom mentioned, Nita Lowy is gonna be the new chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee, the first female to chair that committee, which is very exciting, I think. And, um, She's a, she has a strong record on environmental issues and fighting against environmental riders. Uh, in recent years in the House and in the Senate, one of the ways that we've seen environmental policy get made is through riders on appropriations bills, where they effectively um, create policy in, a, in, a, in an appropriations bill and they're harder to, it's, it's a challenge to fight those riders. And one of the benefits now of having a split Congress in terms of jurisdiction will be that we hopefully will see far fewer of those riders finding their way into appropriations bills because Democrats like Chairwoman Lowy will not be supportive of those kinds of policy riders. I also just wanna note more broadly that the split Congress, the split house, I mean, a split party between House and Senate obviously gives us the chance to uh, see a backstop for some of the administration policies and some of the efforts in the 115th Congress to undermine many of the environmental laws that we care about. It'll be harder for those types of pieces of legislation to move in a Congress, in a split Congress, which um, hopefully will make a, for a more deliberative process in the future. Um, as Tom noted, the first uh, female chairwoman, and I think the important thing for us all to think about with respect to appropriations is the fact that during the past two years of the Trump administration, the White House proposed significant cuts to ocean, coastal, climate, wildlife programs. Those cuts were um, largely ignored by the Congress, which was a good thing. Um, but in 2019, we will face a situation where they not only have to extend the debt limit in Congress, 
but they will also have to contend with the automatic spending cuts that were agreed to in 2011 as part of a deal to raise the debt ceiling. Those types of um, challenges and appropriations will mean that the programs that uh, people on this, pro on this call care about, ocean funding, wildlife funding, those programs will continue to face uh, challenges moving forward and we'll all want to be sure that we're diligent in supporting them and working with the Appropriations Committee to see that we can get the best funding opportunities as you know best funding for those programs that we can and then moving forward. Uh, next slide Tom. So the Natural Resources Committee this will be the committee in the house where all things um, ocean, fish, energy development, uh, wildlife, all the things that folks on this call care about. Most of these things happen in the Natural Resources Committee and the House. And the new chairman, um, as noted, will be Congressman Grijalva from Arizona. He has a, a very strong environmental record. He's a progressive. He's a leader of the Progressive Caucus in the House. And um, he is expected to really, um, it's going to be a big change from the previous leadership, as we'll talk about in a minute. One thing I do want to note about this committee, though, is uh, given the high turnover in the House, this committee will see a lot of turnover in terms of membership. And a lot of the senior members on this committee, folks that have been strong advocates on our issues, like Congressman Beyer, um, potentially Congressman McEachin, some other members that have been good leaders for us, will most likely move to other committees within the House. And there is a strong likelihood that we will see as many as 12 new Democrats, 12 freshman Democrats on, the, on this committee and a proportional, an equally proportion, uh, or excuse me, a proportional number of new Republicans as well. So what that means is a lot of people that don't know a lot about these issues coming onto the committee and a lot of opportunity for folks on this call to, again, um, reach out and start building relationships with the new members of this, the committee. Next slide, Tom. Let me just add one quick thing, Jean, to add to that. I mean, this committee is an important committee for a lot of Western members who have large public lands uh, air, large areas of public lands in their districts and states. And those members right now tend to trend Republican and they tend to stay on the committee a little bit longer than the Democrats uh, do. And so there is more seniority on that committee and experience and background from the Republicans who've been leading it for the last couple, uh, several Congresses. Uh, and so there's a real need you know, there's new friends coming on, but there's a real need to educate them up uh, because their counterparts are going to be ahead of them in terms of the learning curve. Okay, here you go, Jean. Um, just, there was a question uh, while we were talking about the Natural Resources Committee about whether or not we have any ideas about who might join the committee at this point. And that's a great question. The way the committee decisions get made, they start with, um, it'll start in January, and it'll start with first appropriations and what they call exclusive committees, which are committees where uh, if a member is assigned to the appropriations committee, they, they, they aren't on any other committees. So it's a tiered process and they start with the highest level and they work their way down. Natural resources is towards the bottom of that list. So it will most likely be late January or early February before we know who will uh, be assigned to that committee or who will get uh, appointed to that committee. Uh, this is an opportunity if you if you have relationships or you want to think about relationships with newly elected members to um, encourage them to seek a seat on this committee. Um, as you can imagine, everybody wants to be on appropriations, everybody wants to be on um, energy and commerce. Uh, so it's always nice to try and put in the plug with new members for the House Natural Resources Committee, given the jurisdiction it has over the issues that we care about. So thanks for that question. I thought it was a good one. So the answer, end of January, early February. Um, Mr. Huffman from California, who will likely become the chair of the subcommittee over oceans and fisheries. So right now, I just want to note, this is an important point. 
the subcommittee is currently called the Subcommittee on Water, Power, and Oceans, and it has jurisdiction over a huge number of issues. That committee, that subcommittee was reformulated when the chairman, Mr. Bishop, became the leader of the committee in 2011. Every time the committee leadership changes, there is always an analysis of the alignment of subcommittees and how the, jurors, how the different issues are split up in the subcommittees. So right now, it, Mr. Grijalva is very likely doing his own analysis of how he wants to align the subcommittees. So it, it is not certain whether or not water, power, and oceans will be one subcommittee in the next Congress um, and whether or not uh, fisheries, wildlife, and oceans will all be um, all together in one subcommittee or how that will be split up. And so we think Mr. Huffman will be the chairman of that subcommittee, but we're, it's just not certain at this point in time. I just want to note that for people. That is a common process and a common analysis that takes place when the committee leadership changes. This committee, obviously, though, this subcommittee will be of great importance to folks on this call because in some format, it will have jurisdiction over all the um, offshore uh, coastal zone management, fisheries, wildlife, um, Magnus and Stevens Act. The different programs that we care about will most likely be together in some way within the subcommittee. Next slide, Tom. So I think when we talk about the priorities for the new Congress, it's, it's important to know that the House leadership, uh, the Democratic leadership, at the, uh, this summer, basically um, before the election, came forward to announce that their priorities, if they were to be uh, given a new, given the, new, the leadership back again in the House, their priorities would be the following three issues, as you see here, protecting health care, increasing wages through infrastructure, as they refer to it, rebuilding America, and cleaning up corruption. And so I, I note that here because that those three priorities are expected to um, be reflected in the work of all the committees in the next Congress. And so um, while uh, Obviously, protecting health care is not a, a high priority, is not an issue within the Natural Resources Committee per se. Um, infrastructure and increasing wages and cleaning up corruption will be an overarching theme for all the committees as they move forward. And um, next slide. Within the Natural Resources Committee, and I, I, Tom, uh, I like the way we sort of structured this. In, in, the, in this Congress, um, under the leadership of Chairman Bishop, there was a strong focus on legislating. They, there wasn't a lot of focus on investigating anything. That was a common theme we saw across the Congress more broadly. There was not a lot of oversight, as we call it. Um, there was a, obviously the theme to deny and ignore climate change. And there was a, a, an effort, a regular effort to undermine what I would call bedrock environmental laws either through legislative initiatives or riders in appropriations bills, as I mentioned earlier. In the new Congress and under Chairman Grijalva's leadership in the House, um, we, will, we will definitely see a focus on not only legislating, but also on oversight and investigating things that, have been go that they feel um, need to be looked at more closely. I think there'll be a wide range of oversight opportunities. And in fact, the Natural Resources Committee uh, most likely we'll probably have a subcommittee that's either dedicated to oversight or each of the subcommittees will have their own oversight uh, um, schedule or plan. There'll be a, a much more significant focus on climate change. That'll be across, across the committee issues. There, Mr. Grijalva and the members on the Democratic side of the committee have all been for the most part, staunch defenders of bedrock environmental laws from ESA to NEPA. And I think that there, we will see a, a change in the way we talk about the Magnuson Act reauthorization. For the past several Congresses, we've focused on, the Magnuson Act reauthorization has focused on a piece of legislation that was introduced by Congressman Young in every Congress. And that bill will no longer be the bill that will um, lead the discussion in the House. There will be hopefully new legislation to drive the discussion on reauthorizing the Magnuson Act. But I think you'll, you'll see now 
a focus on maintaining the science-based decision-making process in the law that um, has been so successful at rebuilding, rebuilding stocks. Next slide, Tom. And to that point, um, I think we will see a lot of, we'll, we'll most likely see an effort to reauthorize the Magnuson Act. I think everybody supports that. Um, there could be some action on the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, there's been an effort underway to enforce some aspects of the law that have not been enforced in the past. There will be an ongoing effort to renew the Land and Water Conservation Fund and make it permanent. That's been something you've probably heard a lot about over the past several Congresses. Can we, can we make the authorization of the Land and Water Conservation Fund permanent? And can we legislate a situation where we no longer have to rely on the Appropriations Committee to provide the funding for LWCF every year. Can we get an can we get a permanent appropriation that is um, no longer dependent on the Appropriations Committee? That that's a big lift, but there will be an effort in that regard, I'm sure. Hey, Jane, uh, let me Jane, let sure. me just, uh, just for people who aren't familiar with what the Land and Water Conservation Fund is, it's a program that takes royalties from offshore offshore oil and gas drilling and dedicates it to basically buying land on in federal lands. And there's also a, a component of it that sends money to states and local governments as well for a little bit broader purpose, but um, mostly it's a land buying program. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think there will also be a renewed effort to look at um, shark conservation. There's There were a couple of bills in this Congress um, that were uh, considered, and I think that effort will probably be renewed in the next Congress. I think there'll be a lot of discussion about Native American issues in the new Congress um, within the committee. I also think there could be some efforts to look at the plastic pollution issue. Obvious, most people may be aware that um, this, the, the Marine Debris Act was reauthorized this year, but I think there is um, a renewed and expanded focus on the plastic pollution issue that most many people on this call are probably very familiar with. And I think it has the, the broader public awareness has, is driving an interest in Congress to see whether or not um, some more significant legislation could be possible. I don't really know what that would look like right now, but I do think there's a lot of interest in that. I think that could be a very, I think it could be a bipartisan issue. And I do think there will be an effort to legislate, at least in the House, there will be a significant effort to legislate um, against offshore oil and gas drilling, both on the Atlantic and on the Pacific coast. There, there were bills that were introduced in this Congress for both coasts to block offshore drilling. Obviously they did not pass in this Congress. I think that those efforts will be renewed in the next Congress. And I think that based on my conversations with the Natural Resources Committee staff, there, there's a strong possibility that that legislation, um, those legislative initiatives could at least be considered and passed in the House. The Senate, what will happen in the Senate is a different story, of course. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there will likely be a, a lot more oversight in the Natural Resources Committee in the upcoming Congress, and that'll include issues related to the Department of Interior and Secretary Zinke, uh, Antiquities Act decisions. Those are The Antiquities Act is the law that's used to establish uh, national monuments, both on land and in the ocean. Um, there, I think there will be oversight over administrative decisions looking to um, fast track uh, oil and gas production, both on land and in the ocean. And I think there'll just be an ongoing effort to uh, look at more closely how the agencies are operating under this administration. Next slide. Colin, it's all on you. <laughs> so um, I, by the way, I neglected to um, give a more detailed um, introduction to Jean. Uh, in addition to her work on the Natural Resources Committee, she's also um, currently a consultant doing a lot of work with um, several zoo, or I think aquariums uh, and conservation groups on, on ocean issues. So I apologize for that. Um, Colin's um, biography, as he said to me yesterday when we spoke, is, is much shorter 
Um, he worked for a guy named Norm Dix for almost 20 years. Uh, Norm Dix was the chairman of the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee for a while, then the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee for a while on appropriations, and then the full committee chairman. So that's where Colin comes from. And, um, and so we're delighted that he's able to join us. He's going to talk about some of the methods that Wildlife Conservation Society uses and engaging on an issue and use something called the Wild Act as a case study. So Colin, are you on? I am on. All right. Well, so I guess for folks to, oh, if you could just flip back for a second. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, so I guess to fit it within Tom's paradigm, I used to work for Tom's mom and Jean used to work for Tom's dad, I think. Yes. Um, so yeah, just I, Tom and Jean have given a really solid outline of what changes are taking place, who the new members are, and how that's going to affect um, the priorities before a Congress, and particularly in the House. So what I'm hoping to do is to give some insights into how WCS as an organization is taking that, those same data points um, and figuring out how to use them to formulate our strategy for the 116th Congress. Um, I, I want to take a, I'll do one slide with just a couple thoughts on relationship building uh, which may be a little lobbying 101, but, um, and then following up with that case study, as Tom mentioned, on, on, on the WILD Act, using that as the legislative vehicle that we've been working on for some time, um, and how things changing in Congress change our strategy. So I should start out just by explaining a little bit on who WCS is. Um, for our zoo and aquarium partners on here, you know us. Um, we were founded 125 years ago um, at the site of the Bronx Zoo, and we still operate four zoos in New York City and the New York Aquarium. In addition to that, we're also a global NGO working in about 60 countries around the world doing field conservation work, counter wildlife trafficking, anti-poaching, and managing about 200 million acres of protected areas. Um, so during the height of the summer season, we have around 4,000 employees that work for us, uh, which includes our seasonal employees and our infantry field staff. So we're a pretty large organization um, and between, depending on the year, about one quarter to one third of our funding comes from USG funding sources, whether that's federal, state, or local. Um, so for our federal affairs team though, so for 4,000 employees, we have a staff of three here in DC, uh, including two lobbyists that are working on these issues, uh, which for in the aquarium and zoo community is a huge luxury. Um, but for an organization our size working in the NGO community, it's actually pretty small. So we have to make do with a, a pretty limited bandwidth. So next slide, please. So new Congress is coming in and how are we gonna deal with it? Um, first thing that we're doing here, just right after the election, we've looked at, and even a little before the election, we looked at well, what had we been working on? How are those doing? Um, and once the election occurred, are those the same priorities we should continue to have going into the next Congress? Uh, so it started with, um, looking at our own priorities internally, then having a, a thorough set of conversations with all the different program areas within our organization, uh, our zoo and aquarium leadership, um, and uh, some of our regional programs in Africa, Latin America, uh, and in Asia, and then with, with some of the higher ups um, at our executive VP level, um, because that one point there, institutional buy-in that is really important in a fast moving environment that we work in politically. Um, it's really important to have all your ducks in a row internally, um, largely because of that second point, uh, and that is keeping focused. Um, we work in an era when the President of the United States stands on the White House portico and he has like, I think he has this package of bones and he takes out this bone and he waves it in front of our community and says, hey, go chase this. Go chase this on the Arctic Refuge. Go chase this on, on oil drilling. Go chase this on that. And it's very easy as a community and as an organization that deeply cares about these things to go chase those bones. Um, and for the past two years, it's not just been the president. There have also been things in Congress. And with the congressional changeover in the House, there are going to be lots of fabulous legislative initiatives that are, we're all going to want to work on. Um, and by getting institutional buy-in and, and those priorities, we are going to need to keep focused on what it is that we really need to do, what is core to our mission um, and what we got to do um, and not go chasing after all the bones that the president is going to throw. And it's going to continue to be a lot of them. 
Um, I used to work, I didn't used to work in, when I was on the Hill on environmental issues. I actually worked a lot more in the security realm. Uh, and I remember one military officer who was talking to me and said, look, in a target rich environment, it is almost impossible to stay on mission. And, and I think that, I still think of that line every time we do, we have one of these institutional discussions about what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. So next step is then, okay, what resources are we going to have available, which is often a constant changing things at organizations is as your fundraising goes up and down and, and things change. Um, you have to be careful about managing your time and bandwidth. Um, boards change. It's good. You need, there needs to be that constant assessment of what political connections do we have, not just with our lobbying team, but with our, our senior leadership. Uh, because some of those connections, when we got our new CEO, Christian Samper, coming in, we discovered that we had, from his time at the Smithsonian, some two or three new key um, connections uh, with folks like Senator Leahy. Uh, and it's important to, to constantly do that process of, of assessing who, who within our own organization has these connections and how we can use them. Um, and then looking at external force multipliers. Um, and I do shout outs to folks on this call from our, our friends at AZA and our friends at the Aquarium Conservation Partnership. Those are really good force multipliers that help you leverage small bits of your own time into larger actions, larger, more effective actions. Um, so then once you figured out what you want to, what you're going to work on, what resources you have to work on it, we are going through the process now of, okay, what are the opportunities going to be? And, and Gene just did a really good job of, of listing some of those opportunities that are going to be there uh, from the House Natural Resources Committee, um, looking through this particular snapshot in time. So we're going through the process ourselves. Where do our priorities coincide with the priorities of these new folks coming in uh, so that we can leverage these great opportunities in order to have some success on, on some of these initiatives that we're working on? And then the last part of it is identifying, okay, what targets, what are, who are our member targets that we've got to go after to do this? Starting with your local connections, we have very strong, our own congressman is uh, from the Bronx, is Jose Serrano, who, as Tom pointed out, is likely the new chair of the Commerce Appropriations Subcommittee. So for our marine issues, we have a go-to person in a key spot. Um, our other congresswoman from the Bronx now is uh, Ocasio-Cortez, who is just coming in. And... Uh, um, so we are going to keep a close eye on what committee is she going to land on? A lot of folks land on resources, starting out from the Democratic side um, for a variety of reasons. If she ends up there, if she ends up on House Foreign Relations uh, as a freshman, build those, we'll build those local connections anyway, because you never know when you might need someone or they might have a, an ability to help you. But uh, we'll be looking very closely for local connections on some of these committees, particularly natural resources, which will have a lot of new members. Uh, looking for folks in key positions like Serrano, like Nita Lowy, another New Yorker that we that we built a relationship over time. Then looking for members who all, who, through reading press, through listening to them talk, have clearly have an issue interest uh, where their issues align. We've gone through and looked at folks, for example, who have connections with uh, Democrats who have connections with the military, because a lot of the work we're doing on wildlife trafficking has a particular. Uh, interest to folks um, who who may have been stationed in Africa or who worked in Africa, so we're trying to find some of those connections where we might have a, an unusual confluence of interest there that can be of value. So once you have your priorities and you know what you're investing, you know where your issues are moving, um, you've found the people who are connected, then you can get to work uh, and start working on stuff. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So I just wanted to talk very briefly on the very lobbying 101 issue of just building relationships on the Hill. It, I think for members of Congress, it's very much like the work that, that you and your organizations are already doing with high level donors. Um, that's in a lot of ways what a member of Congress is, but it, there's an extra avenue here of, of staff. Um, point number two I have up here. It, it's really good to start with the staff up here, because as Gene will tell you, Gene and I were never elected, uh, nor was Tom, but we sure did a lot of the work where the rubber met the road for our bosses. And um, so building those relationships with staff early on the Hill uh, is really quite important. 
Uh, and well, can I just add something to that? Yes, please. Um, the first time you go to a member's office to meet with the staff, you'll be shocked because <laughs> they look like they're still in middle school and you think that you have been uh, shunted off on some low level person, but those are the people. In most members' offices, the staff are very young. Um, they probably are just out of college, but they're the people talking to their boss. Right. And they're nope. the people that you need to build the relationships with. And the next time you go to the office, that person could have been promoted to a much higher level. And so I, I just like to like tell people, don't be, don't be shocked the first time you go in an office and you see somebody that is far too young to be doing the job that they're doing in your view. And um, you have to just don't just, you have to just treat everybody as if they are the decision maker because they often are. And let me just add one thing to that. If you have a relationship with a staff person that you know their boss is not returning and you have not been in touch with them, just drop them a line, you know, saying something like, it's great working with you. Hope to, you know, let me know where you land and look forward to working with you in the future because um, there, there will be movement. Yeah, I, th I think those are two great points. Uh, to Gene's point, when I left the Hill at the age of, at the, the ripe old age of 44, I had been the oldest staffer in the room um, in a lot of hearings I'd been in for the better part of 10 years. Um, and uh, so it, it really is true. It's, a, it's very much a young person's uh, game because the hours are very long uh, and it requires just a tremendous amount of energy sustained over 12 hour, 12 and 14 hour periods. Um, and they don't get paid much. Uh, which once you get a little bit older and have families, you just, you just can't do that job anymore. Um, but, uh, and also to Gene's point, those staff get promoted very quickly. There's a lot of turnover in the house and there are people move for other, move to other jobs. Um, so that person you were meeting with who was originally just doing letters, uh, writing letters for their member of Congress, uh, very soon becomes the, um, becomes the legislative assistant who's covering that whole area. And then within a couple of years, maybe the legislative director who's, who's in a real decision-making spot for their boss. So, um, so those staff relationships are really, really important. Um, the other point I, I'll, I'll go use here, and it's something that we at WCS, I don't think use enough, which kind of surprises me, uh, which is using your facilities. Um, our facilities at mu these museums, aquariums and zoos that we that we work at and we love these are the, very often the gems of our community um, and they give us an automatic in with members of congress because they know them members almost almost all the members from your local area have been to your facilities at one point in time and they know your facility so even if they don't know you personally or know your ceo uh, they know your facility and they're interested so use your facility to your best um, like you would with a donor. Make those invitations, not just to members, but also to the staff. Get them to come see you um, in your own native habitat, in your own buildings. Um, and just show them what you do, show them behind the scenes what you do. And that's a relationship that will build very quickly. And I think we have great, great value to you. Um, and the last point on this slide I wanted to make is take advantage of these force multipliers. I mentioned ACP and AZA. Both of those organizations do, do Flyins, uh, and those flyins are outstanding opportunities to get some help um, coming back here to DC, meeting with your members of Congress, meeting with other members in your delegation. When you have two or three facilities from a um, from a state that are going that are coming back, you have a much higher chance of getting a meeting with your senator um, than you do if it's just your organization coming back. So leverage these opportunities. Uh, to come back and join. And you know, I think you'll find that they're very useful, not just networking within your own organization uh, or with that trade group, but also with getting you access to members and senators you don't normally have. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Colin, I'm gonna pull a moderator's prerogative and, and help go through this really quickly. Well, I was gonna skip over this slide and go yeah, to the next slide. Yeah, actually. just and I, to remind people, these are, these are all great things and the Multi-Species Conservation Fund is something we have a historic role in. A lot of our institutions have sold stamps that help fund these programs. And again, to remind folks, this is all gonna be captured on the Ocean Project's website and you can return to this uh, slide. So here you go to the next one. Thank you. Um, so 
the Wild Act is a case study. We have had this long-standing priority at WCS to renew the Multinational Species Conservation Fund, which for the zoo and aquarium side of, this, uh, of folks that are here, you're probably familiar with. It provides grants for elephants, great apes, rhinos, tigers, and marine turtle conservation around the world. It's a very flexible funding source, but the authorization expired in 2012, which puts it at risk of being canceled. Um, so as we're figuring out how, how do we work on this, we look at some of the things I talked about earlier. We had resources available. We had a there's a strong coalition that works on the Multinational Species Fund of 30 plus organizations led by WCS, WWF, but also including some, some less usual suspects like the Safari Club, which represents trophy hunters, uh, and Feld Entertainment, which for the longest time uh, ran the circus. So sometimes these coalitions, which have uh, odd bedfellows, um, can give you access to some, some parts of, the, of Congress that you can't often get. Uh, and we had institutional and partner commitments from a lot of these organizations that they were willing to invest the resources on this. What we didn't have was the right opportunity. It was, we struggled and struggled and struggled. Then, you know, working our networks, we heard that Senator Barrasso was looking for a bipartisan wildlife bill. He'd just taken over as chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee and, and wanted a, an early success. Um, so we hightailed it over there, uh, talked to him, talked to his staff, but also talked to, figured out what the key targets were on that committee. For us, it was our locals, Gillibrand and Booker, who from New Jersey and New York, who, uh, who we serve their constituents on a daily basis. Folks in key positions like Senator Sullivan from Alaska and Senator Carper, who's the ranking Democrat, uh, is in this Congress, the ranking Democrat on that committee. And folks who have a keen issue interest on this, like Senator Inhofe, who loves marine turtles, and Senator Whitehouse, who is a big fan of all marine issues. So we, we quickly got in with them, um, and we developed the WILD Act, which going back to, the, we won't go back to the previous slide, but it, it includes reauthorization of the multinational species, including, and also includes a number of other priorities of Senator Barrasso and Senator Carper. So we were able to use this kind of a catch-all for wildlife to create a vehicle that now suddenly had some member horsepower behind it. Next slide. So now we get to the end of the Congress. The bill has not passed, and although there is a sliver of a chance that it could be a part of a lands package here at the end of the Congress, uh, I am not such an optimist that I think that's really going to happen. So ultimately, we stalled in the House. So now we're in the process, well, what prevented our success? Ultimately, it's because it was not a priority of the House leadership. Um, and even and all across the board, it was competing with some other issues like that there were higher profile issues that both chairs were working on. So we we're looking for the opportunity to pass it. What is that opportunity? Well, there's new house leadership that has a greater interest in wildlife and wildlife issues. So we are now developing our targets, obviously Congressman Grijalva, but other folks on the committee and new folks who are coming into the committee to help us get over that finish line. So that, that, is, that is my presentation. I, I hope that gave you a, a nugget or two that might be useful. I'm sure organizations are going through the same sort of uh, internal analysis uh, and priority setting for what you are going to devote your limited resources to on uh, federally. Um, so I hope this gave a little bit of insight and just to reiterate one point, stay focused. There are a million things you're gonna be able to jump at. It's really important to figure out what are the one or two or three that are truly important to your organization and try to stay there. And by coming to that agreement early, when folks who influence your decision making get excited about something, you have something to bring them back to to keep them focused. Thank you. All right, thanks, Colin. Um, that was great. Um, we're uh, just so everybody knows this is the last. <laughs> this is the last slide. So we are right at the finish line. Um, and I just two quick one quick follow up to what Colin talked about is. You know, WCS has resources that a lot of other people don't have, but the processes they use to evaluate how to engage and whether to engage is something I think everybody can use. And then you got to figure it out within your, your own resources. So hopefully there's some stuff in there that you can transfer, um, you know, to the scale of your organization. Um, two quick things. Um, one, there was a question about the future of the Endangered Species Act attack. I think if you go back to Gene's um, uh, presentation. Uh, this is a, a great example where uh, Chairman Grijalva will backstop any challenges to it legislatively and push back on any changes 
that are attempted uh, administratively by uh, the president. The second thing is a bit of a housekeeping question. Um, we are currently doing our second sur annual survey on sort of attitudes, um, uh, opportunities um, of that institutions are, I'm not describing this well, because I'm trying to hurry, but for uh, on government relations, interest and aptitude and the types of issues you may be engaged on the, in the, in the uh, in the chat section, there is a link to the survey and uh, we'll also be distributing it uh, a little bit more widely through other avenues. Um, so um, just to try to wrap up the main themes today is I hope we gave everybody a sense of the opportunity that now exists just because of the dynamic of Congress changing uh, from Republic the House changing to the Democrats, these changes in party control of the chamber um, are, are always very dynamic and, and it takes some time to, to settle it. Um, I think the real demographic changes is gonna be an interesting thing to watch and the subtext of that are the number of veterans that are now in Congress, 22 this Congress going back to D Desert Storm. It's a real growing thing. And when I got to Washington, the World War II generation were all in leadership positions and they had causes bigger than Democrat or Republican. They kind of looked at each other as a common purpose. And it'll be interesting to see how these veterans basically begin to interact with each other and if they're able to change uh, the culture. We talked about uh, you know, the WILD Act being something that didn't get traction in the House. Um, Magnuson Stevens was another uh, one. You know, we talk about legislation being stuck that's our vernacular. There's opportunities for it to get unstuck. Um, and so hopefully we'll get some stuff done because the, it, there's a much greater opportunity for on some of these bills for a Democratic Resources Committee to work with their counterparts in the Senate just because the agenda is different. Um, again, I think we all talked about no time like the present to cultivate. The best time to do it is the first few months of a Congress it, things are beginning to get established, priorities set, and all that other stuff in this Congress with 20% new. It's never been more true. And as Colin said, I was that 24-year-old staffer. Uh, you know, if you couldn't win me, you're never going to win my boss. And they need people to give them good, sound, quality information. And that's the type of information zoos, aquariums, and museums uh, can provide. And then finally, uh, going back to a point in Collins' presentation is it, for especially a new member, um, invite them to tour your facility, give them a sense of what you're about. It's a great photo opportunity. Um, we used to do it at Brookfield Zoo as often as we can, could, uh, and then frame the picture and take it back to the office. And if it's hanging on the wall, you know you've won a little bit. And then um, there are more than, there are other AZ, uh, I'm sorry, other lobby days other than AZA. Uh, AAM has them. There's other opportunities if you're engaged on issues. Come to Washington. It makes a huge difference when people like Jean and Colin and I go into an office. We're just another Washington, well, Jean lives in Portland, but she commutes, but we're just another Washington person. But you're a constituent, and that carries so much more power. Um, so again, um, thank you to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And then, uh, you know, the third reminder that we will soon have uh, a PDF version of the slides and the recording of this webinar uh, on the Ocean Project website. Thank you all for joining us. And we will have our next webinar uh, in early January. And we hope you all be able to join us then. Thank you very much.